briefly touch upon how we approach uh, the issue of today of labor rights, but I would like to start with a more version actually made by Australia. Uh, you're obviously much more connected to the Asia Pacific region than uh, Europeans are, and I was in the US uh, two weeks ago talking about sustainability. And it's the way we, or the way uh, these countries approach is pretty different from uh, the way Australia does. Uh, sustainability is definitely more on the agenda in, in, uh, in Australia than it is in the US. It's becoming much more important in Europe too, uh, with UK, the stewardship code becoming more important. But it's still, for many people, uh, certainly if you're talking about labor rights and uh, supply chain issues, it's still far from a bad show for many in Europe and the US. Now, if you look at how Candium, uh, as uh, Mavre actually uh, explained it, Candium stands for uh, Conviction and Responsibility and Asset Management uh, Project. Before elaborating on the labor uh, rights issue, I would briefly take the time, if you allow me, I would briefly take the time to explain how we approach uh, ESG. Uh, Canon is actually an, an, an asset manager who's covering nearly all asset classes. So we're, we're engaged in uh, equity, uh, fixed income, uh, uh, even asset allocation. And currently we're managing about 20 billion uh, under the broad ESG, um, uh, ESG umbrella. Uh, our approach is uh, probably a little different from uh, many others in our sector in a way that we have a very balanced view on ESG. For us, uh, sustainability has many dimensions and we have actually built a framework around uh, the three topics, environment, social and governance. And obviously if you talk about labor rights, uh, labor rights comes into play when you're talking about the social issue. Um, for, it's, uh, for some kind of sectors it might be uh, one of the key issues. The way we do it actually is uh, we have kind of a best-in-class screening um, and that best-in-class screening has two uh, evaluation frameworks. So we have like a top-down view where for each sector we look at the long-term sustainable trends. And if you really look at labor rights, uh, supply chain, uh, where we're really starting to look at this kind of issues is in terms of health and wellness uh, from our top-down view. But Going more into detail, uh, we have also a bottom-up view where we really look at, at the micro perspective, that's our stakeholders perspective, and we have six pillars, and the most traditional ones are investors, um, uh, employees, suppliers, customers. So the part of our micro or stakeholder perspective where labor rights are very key is obviously in employees and supply chains. But for us, as, a, as an, uh, a global asset manager, we're still very global. Uh, most of our funds we're selling are developed markets and emerging markets, so it's a very global perspective we take on, on ESG. I think in terms of labor rights and uh, supply chain, the biggest problem for us and for our team, so our, we have a dedicated analyst team who's uh, doing analysis on all the environmental, social and governance issues that these sectors confronted with. The biggest problem is probably is mapping the supply chain. Because uh, it's not only the first layer, but it's also sub, uh, suppliers, it's about uh, recruiters, it's about labor brokers. So this is the whole um, area that we are uh, doing analysis on and then looking at how labor rights are respected. And we're, from that regard, we're looking at very broadly. We're looking at uh, do they respect uh, the international standards, so the uh, International Labor Office, what's their uh, code of conduct, how are they auditing, uh, this kind of stuff. The biggest problem here is obviously is, is traceability and uh, risk assessment. So uh, for our analysts, probably, if you look at, at uh, each sector in itself, our analysts are doing a review every one to three years. Each review takes a lot of time and probably the, the, uh, the biggest chunk is engaging with companies because it's part, partly educational. Uh, first of all, because many companies are still not convinced that it's important from a regulatory perspective, from a reputational perspective, and that's where I think investors are pretty important here. We have a role to play, and that's what our, our analysts are actually doing. It's, it's, a, it's an interaction, so you're trying to convince companies of the importance of issues that we're working on. Labor rights, obviously, uh, one part of it. You're trying to educate them, and on the other side, it's getting information from them. Uh, when you're talking about education, I suppose, um, for all of you, um, do you, do you feel you're actually accessing that level of the organisation when it comes to their decision making on ethical issues in the supply chain? 
How's that going? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think, like, like Gershwin mentioned it before, I think the Rana Plaza building collapse was really a, a catalyst for change. So in the aftermath of that, we've had some major conversations with both management of, of, re, of listed retailers and also boards. And I think gradually there's been more and more interest in actually getting to know the details. Now, you know, there's a broad spectrum. On, on, on the one hand, you have companies where they, you know, they've had lip service for these things. In other cases, you have boards where the chairman or other directors might actually be personally very involved in these in these issues. So I think it's a bit of a mix actually, but definitely I think the Rana Plaza was that catalyst that you know, like Gershwin has said it as well, sort of had to happen to to, to bring that issue to to the forefront. I don't know if anyone else has any any, any views on that. I think uh, Kmart was one of the great examples of that. Like Guy Russo was out um, in front of the media straight after saying, we thought we had some of these issues covered. We had no idea how bad they were. And because it was happening at that level, the executive level of the organisation, they've gone from being one of the, in terms of our grading systems, one of the poorly graded companies to one of the best performers. And that's because there has been that board level of engagement. Um, and executive level of engagement to improve systems. And that's consistently what we find, um, that boards, when the boards are involved and when the executive are involved, you get much better outcomes in terms of how they invest in this and progress these issues. But the motivations for those groups being involved varies. So if a media story blows up enough time in the face of the executives, then they'll get concerned and then they'll want to get educated about these issues. So that's, uh, speaking from a campaigner perspective, I suppose it's different, a little bit different from the investor perspective. But I'm sure it's those same risks to the, the brand reputation that allows these ESG conversations to open up when you're an investor coming in. So increasingly, because there's been so much attention on it here in Australia, we find that we are engaging at the executive level at the least and occasionally at the board level as well. And certainly um, in talking to sustainability managers, that's their big moment of opportunity when there's some kind of crisis and it's got you know, divestment of stranded assets. Yeah. That gives them that, that's probably the biggest issue. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, engage with companies and by explaining our process. Mm. Certainly in Europe, I think in Europe, uh, sustainability has evolved quite a bit. Mm. Um, uh, been very popular in France for a very long time, UK coming on board now, Germany too. Legislation is different, obviously, in all these kind of countries, but we're still seeing that we still need to educate companies on on why it is important. Because for many, it still feels like the reputational risk is, is, is important, but that's 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 one issue, reputational risk. But for it's more like uh, what it, how it brings value to a company, and uh, there's still a lot of education go that's needed from a corporate perspective. I think uh, as an asset manager, too, uh, obviously we work with data. Um, and companies are not used to, certainly if you talk about supply chains, uh, they're not used to getting data from their suppliers, sub-suppliers, that's even a bigger issue. Uh, so by engaging with these kind of companies, educating them on what is important, they're kind of forced to, uh, obviously kind of can't do it on its own, uh, but if more and more investors uh, are embarking on this mission, uh, I think companies gradually become convinced of the importance of ESG, not only from a reputational perspective, but because for me, reputation is one thing, but it's too negative, you know, because you're most of, often talking about the blow up uh, <coughs> events, uh, which, is, which are always very unfortunate, and uh, it's kind of wake up call for a company. For us, it's more like being uh, anticipating, uh, trying to anticipate and trying to educate them on uh, how to avoid these kind of reputational events, you know. I know that investing for a lot of clients is, is a journey more than anything and a lot of these considerations are built into medium to long term views. How do you manage the conversation when it comes to short term performance, especially when they have a peer relative um, bias when they look at performance? Uh, that's a very good question actually. <laughs> that's one of the... Let me put it this way. For me, like I said before, I don't... It's an issue, obviously. Uh, if you look at sustainability from a risk perspective, like uh, regulatory <coughs> risk, uh, reputational risk, uh, that's definitely an issue. But I like, I prefer to approach it from a much more broad view in terms of risk return. For me, sustainability, or it's still very intangible, okay, uh, but it does have an impact on the long-term risk and return of a company. 
And for me, uh, sustain incorporating sustainability in, into an investment strategy is very similar to what the more traditional uh, managers do. And uh, if you want to be a prudent investor, you incorporate as much information as possible, and it's still very financially driven. Why? Because obviously, if you look at financial data available uh, in terms of accounting statements, uh, we have a history of nearly 40, 50 years in terms of uh, publishing financial data. In terms of sustainability, it's still very in its infancy, but it's very important. And the way I'm, we're trying to convince investors is uh, take that long-term view, because you cannot expect uh, sustainability to materialize over the short run. When you look at the investor perspective on this, there's a lot of different um, considerations. I mean, if you look at, if the starting point is brands, so brands are <coughs> often the equivalent of a big, big proportion of a company's market capitalization, but they're also very vulnerable and they're also very, um, they're, they're very time consuming to, to, to restore if they get damaged. And that can happen in short term, it can happen in long term. So that brand risk is always going to be there. But then also I think you can look at supply chain management as a bit of a proxy for management quality, which I think is what we've alluded to as well. So if I meet with a company today and I, I feel that they're paying lip service to labor rights issues in Bangladesh three years after Rana Plaza, I think it tells me something about the quality of that management. So when we when we, when we invest in companies, we do our own proprietary ESD research, and that feeds into all those four stages of our investment process, so macroeconomic analysis, sectoral, stock selection, and portfolio construction. And ultimately, what we want is to invest in companies that have sustainable earnings. We want to invest in companies that have good management quality. But I think ESG on the whole can be a good assessment of management quality. So it's a bit of a proxy there. So the other thing is, even though an issue might be long term by nature, it's going to play out over, over a long time. The way a company is preparing for that now, I think, is another way to, to, to gauge management quality. So if they're not paying attention to long term issues, well, it says something about their own, their, their own uh, investment horizon and how, how long they're going to stick around in the company. And then the, the, the last part, I think, is active ownership. So when you invest in a company, you want to reduce the risk of value destruction. And I, often with the engagements on these issues, I think, I think it's a win-win situation. So investors can be better off, companies can be better, be better off, but also the work is at the end of a, at the, at the end of a chain. It doesn't necessarily work. Does collaboration on things like the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accord mm. um, or broader, almost pre-competitive um, pushes on, on some of these issues allow Australian retailers to punch above their weight in terms of their absolute dollar spend in some of these developing countries? Yeah, uh, co collaboration I think is key. If, if, you, if, you're back, if you take it back to say five or six years ago, um, many companies were very unwilling to share the, the location of their, of their suppliers. It was considered IP. <coughs> and you take it back to 2015, 16, and suddenly a lot of listed retailers are now published the list of, uh, of names that, that they're sourced from. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been a big, big change. I think there is much more collaboration today than they, they used to be. <coughs> uh, and certainly when you go to a manufacturing hub like Bangladesh in China, it seems to be the case that all the retailers seem to know who's sourcing from where anyway. So yeah. it's not like it's been a, a major secret. The Bangladesh Accord, I think, was a bit of a game changer in the sense that it was a multi uh, stakeholder framework. So not only were the retailers collaborating with each other, but also NGOs and unions. And if you look at some of these issues, like the living wage issue, for instance, it is a multi-stakeholder issue. Um, you, know, you, you need to have governments and probably retailers, unions and, and NGOs involved for those things. So I, I think we'll see more of those multi-stakeholder frameworks going forward, because I think that that's needed to, to, to make that change happen. So collaboration serves many purposes, obviously, and that's one of the issues. Uh, but for us, it's more, it's uh, like Gershon said, that you you try to leverage each uh, capabilities, and uh, obviously NGOs, media has has role to play, uh, other stakeholders like governments and and investors. And for us, uh, collaboration is also an issue of, of transparency in terms of uh, collecting data. Uh, we have a big analyst team, but still, uh, to have a very balanced view from and environmental, social and governance perspective on a company requires a lot of data, a lot of analysis. So uh, we're engaging not only with companies but also with uh, NGOs, with governments to, to get that data. So uh, collaboration is, is obviously very important. Um, I'm from the Australian Human Rights Commission. I'm just wondering, 
as an investor, uh, where and how do you draw the line when investing companies to become aware of the human rights issues? Mm. Uh, where do you draw the line? For the simple, um, the draw we draw the line if they don't respect uh, human rights, labor rights, uh, based on what we call the United Nations Global Compact standards. Uh, if they don't respect, if they don't, if they are badly scored on our uh, employees and supplier uh, criteria. We don't invest, very simple. We're not allowed to invest, actually. Uh, and probably what's, it is changing, obviously, but what sets us a little bit apart, our, our philosophy is that our portfolio managers are not allowed to invest, even if they're from a purely financial perspective, we love a company or think it's a good company. Uh, if we think that there are major labor issues uh, or supply chain issues, we're not allowed to invest. So that's where we draw the line. Uh, I know there's a, from, a, from an investor perspective, in terms of integrating sustainability into the investment process, there's a lot of leeway uh, that is allowed to uh, portfolio managers, and there's certainly a lot of greenwashing, uh, greenwashing going on in our industry that we have to admit, unfortunately. Uh, but from a country perspective, uh, for us, it's, pretty, it's very clear, actually. Uh, we have a very specific uh, evaluation framework on human rights and labor rights. Uh, and if you have a breach, a severe breach, or multiple small breaches, or uh, your policy or your strategy um, doesn't comply with what we think is the highest standard in terms of labor rights and uh, human rights, we will not invest in a company. And adding to that, um, obviously, and I agree with Mons and with, with the Gershon, traceability and transparency is important. And transparency is sometimes, even for companies, very complex and very difficult because the supply chain is very big and very long and things get changed uh, in many ways. Uh, but still, we engage with companies, we require the data, and if they're, not, if they're unwilling to provide the data, it won't be part of our final best-in-class universe. So we go that far, actually, if they don't provide the data, if it's important for us and they don't, don't provide the data, it won't be part of our universe, our investable universe. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, a lot of the factors go into that investment decision-making process. Um, we don't have the, the sort of hard and fast rules as we have described, but it, there's a lot of factors that go into that decision. If we have serious ESG concerns, whatever that might be, we might decide not to invest in that company. If we already hold the company, it's a different story. Then it comes down to the question, well, do, do you divest because of that? Or do you think you can actually have a more impact by engaging with the company? In my experience, I think if, 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 you, if you hold a company and suddenly there is a major issue, I think you have, a, you, have, you have leverage as an investor to engage with the company on that issue. So, yeah, in that, depending on, it, in, you know, it always depends on case, case by case. But if, if there is an issue where you think the company could, 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 improve, could improve their performance and actually solve some of these issues, I think we're better off engaging with that company. That, that's my perspective on it. Mm.